Alleluia. Everyone stand. Alleluia. 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 It is such a blessing to be with you as a deacon for 15 years. I have to say that one of the greatest blessings in my life by far is to be a deacon and be surrounded by so many holy deacons and holy deacons. Amen? Last May, um, my world was turned upside down. You know, we used to sing this song, Marianne and I. Surprise, surprise, God is a surprise. I get a phone call from Bishop Tim Pryor that said, I really need to meet with you right away. And what do you think I did? What have I done? <laughs> and so he met with me and then two other people were with him. And I go, what's, you know, what's going on? And he said that we want to build around you a new approach to evangelization. In fact, to the point where as this new director of evangelization formation, you will have uh, teens, young adults, Curcio, uh, evangelization, Emmaus, and actually seven different departments doing all the college campuses with the idea that the focal point of strategic plan is evangelization. And that's what happened in 2018, but now I've been appointed to head up the new strategic plan starting next year with Father Angelos in which evangelization is front and center. So as I listen, you can imagine, you know, I'm thinking to myself, working with the diocese, right? Is that what I want to do at this stage of my life? But they were saying, look at what you need, whatever you need, let us know, because we want this to work. And I said, this is what I need. I need to build around the deacons and deacons' wives. Because I have never met a group of people that I admire more than you. I have never met a group of people more than I admire each one of you. Ever! You agree with that? In terms of yourself, in terms of admiring yourself, the people around you you admire, in fact, I want you to turn to the people around you and say, thank you for your yes. Thank you for your yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your yes. Thank you. Thank you. So what I said Thank you. to that team, and Bishop Van called me up and said, we need to make a decision. And I said, oh, you know, my whole life is going to change. We're running a worldwide ministry right now called Spiritual Hearts. We have a worldwide radio network, Spiritual Radio. I was doing all these other things. So again, you're asking me now to come inside, come in to, to head up this, this huge new department. I said, how can I do that? He said, I'll tell you what. Spiritual Hearts Ministry and the Diocese will become one. So what do you mean? In other words, we will merge them together. We will support you in what you're trying to do. So we are actually going around the world with iThirst. I know a number of you were at our iThirst kickoff on the 19th. Raise your hand if you were there. Let's give them a hand. Thank you so much. We got so many accolades on that. And we're going to have a one-year follow-up to that. People are so excited about it. We will be in Los Angeles. We'll be in Fresno. We're going to have an high thirst on 10th and 11th of March. That will be all young adults. In fact, today, 30 young adults are being trained for St. Paul's Street Evangelization. Is that a great thing? Learn how to evangelize. Is that a great thing? Uh, is that a great thing? Uh, I know it's after lunch, but... <laughs> Stand up and give God a big hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
is the number one priority of the church because we love each other and we want each other to be in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. There is so much darkness out there. It is time to take back the darkness with the light of Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. It is time not to sit on the sideline. It is time not to be lukewarm. It is time to be on fire. Fuego. 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 It is time to be on fire for Jesus Christ. I don't need to tell you the statistics. I think you know what they are. There are parishes all over that have dropped 50% of the population. The numbers are so unbelievable that, just to let you know on young adults, we have six young adults in this house, 62 parishes. Six. I can tell you statistic after statistic that will just absolutely astonish you, perhaps. So as I sat down with Bishop Dyer, I said, I have one condition that the cornerstone of this new apartment, and actually I'd already talked to the, the deacon Tom about it, that the cornerstone of this new department would be working with the deacons and deacon wives to be the vanguard, the catalyst for evangelization throughout the diocese. They would be the leaders in building evangelization teams, leaders in terms of setting a fire their parishes. Are you with me? Are you with me? Give God a hand for that again. Hallelujah. 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 My brothers and sisters, if we don't bring people to Christ, then who will be? Where's Deacon Frank? There he is. Let's hear it for Deacon Frank and Mary. Those of us who have been around for a while, if not you, then if not you, then that's not very loud. If not you, then if not now, then did I get that right? If not you, then who? You know, many times deacons are looking at themselves and they're going, oh, that's not my role. I'm liturgy, I'm outreach. But here's the thing. When you're outreaching to people, don't you want to give them the bread of life? When you're out reaching, feeding the poor, don't you want to tell them about Jesus, the reason why you're there? Amen? Amen. I know I was ministering in Hawaii. Shame on me. <laughs> Maybe I should pick another example. But I was in Hawaii, and uh, at 6 a.m. on Saturday mornings, they were feeding the homeless, of which there were like hundreds. And I asked the, the team there from one of the local Catholic churches, I said, do you tell them about Jesus? They go, no, we just give them food. You see, that's what we do. We do wonderful things in the poor. We do wonderful things in, in outreach. But if we just do, if we just give them food and clothing, a shelter, that's wonderful. But that doesn't stay for all of eternity. What stays for all of eternity is for us to tell them about Jesus Christ. Amen? So one of the things that we can do is transform our ministries to not just be giving out food, not just be giving out clothing, not just to be doing things like we normally would do, but to tell them, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know how much he loves you? Do you understand that Jesus sent me to meet with you? That Jesus sent us to give you this food, this clothing. I'm a missionary like you. I'm a missionary in the Philippines. 
I spent months and months in the Philippines. I saw school. that film last night. I started literally crying because we built a church in Tondo where the average life expectancy was 41 years of age, where the average income was $2 a day, and they had no church. There were 300,000 people living in a garbage dump. And we said, enough is enough. But you know what else we did? We evangelized them. We told them why we were doing it. We told them about Jesus. We told them that at, at the end of the day, the most important thing was that Jesus loves them. The most important thing is that we were sent for them. We did the same thing with the children in the Manila area. We helped build an orphanage and many, many other things, hospitals, all kinds of things. Then we were sent to Indonesia in the jungles of Indonesia. The priest, excuse me, the bishop there called for us. If you don't know anything about Indonesia, it's the largest Muslim country in the world. So what are we doing there? Well, 27% of the West Catholic is Catholic. But you know where they are? They're in the jungles. So we traveled in the jungles and we would come, we travel, and you know, dirt, they were all dirt roads with, we had to be pulling, I mean, it was unbelievable how bad it was. We had no running water, we had no electricity. I ended up being dumb dead fever and a bell obstruction when I went to uh, the Philippines. But in any case, it didn't matter, I'd do it again. But we'd be there, and all of a sudden, we come into this little tiny chapel, clearing, little tiny chapel. But then the word would come out. Do you know that we, people, we had mass, but people waited to be prayed over for four and five hours? We gave them, everywhere we went, we gave clothing, we gave food, we gave all kinds of things. But what we gave them was Jesus. That's what we need to do. As deacons and deacons' wives, you are well suited to give them Jesus. Every single day of the week can make a difference. I'm on an airplane, and this woman is next to me. Yeah, she's in the uh, aisle seat. I'm, I'm in the window seat. The Lord said, I want you to evangelize her. I want to share with her how much I love her. And you know what I said? I don't want to do it. I know when it's it was late at night. I sat on one I'm tired. I had a Bible out. And you see, many times we don't want to do it. And so five minutes went by, ten minutes, it was a short flight. Thirty minutes went by. All of a sudden, a bell went off. You know, like in an airplane, the bells go off. You know? And I felt like there's a bell that went off. We have it. And she looks at me and she says, I see you're reading the Bible. I'm a Christian too. I go, okay, you know, here we go. So I said, um, oh, okay, thanks. And then she just starts blurting out. She says, well, I'm married. I have a child. You know, I'm, I'm Catholic or Christian, actually, she said. But I, my, my husband takes them on a business trip. So I've been with my, my lover. So you can imagine, right? I looked up, I said, what did you get me into? Come on. And so then I said, I didn't know what to say. So I started praying. And I said, tell me what to say. Because when you in sharing your faith, it's not ready, fire, aim. It's ready, aim, fire. So you can pray and say, Lord, tell me what to say. And so the Lord said, just ask her a couple questions. So I said, well, tell me about it. She said, well, my husband ignores me. And this other man gets me attention. And so I said, hey, now what, Lord? And the Lord said, ask her this question. My question was, how does what you're doing bring you closer to Christ? She looks at me. Uh, uh, doesn't. And so I just have one more question. How is what you're doing bring you closer to your husband? And she looked at me and she says, oh. she said, this is exactly the way God works. God doesn't bring you a brick, but a feather, and you're my feather. She starts crying, the bells are going off, the, 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 
you know, everything's, we're landing and, and the wheels are down. And she says, I believe that other person and I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. Good God, I need to thank you. My brothers and sisters, we are called to make a difference each moment of each day. We are called to inspire. We are called to motivate. We are called to build up. When I was with Bishop Dan and I asked him, I said, what do you want for your parishes? And he answered and he said, I want my parishes on fire for Jesus Christ. What is Luke 12, 49? I wish to set the word the world ablaze, and I wish it was already on fire. What did the two people say, the, the disciples say on the road to Emmaus after Jesus left? Were our hearts not on fire? The question I have for you, my brothers and sisters, is are your hearts on fire to have souls saved through your involvement? Jesus saved souls, but it's your intervention that can make a difference. To invite people, and we're going to have over the next few hours, we're going to talk about the various ways that we can, quote, evangelize, which all that means is good for us. The various ways that we can use our ministry as husbands and wives to make a difference with married couples, to make a difference with you, to make a difference with people around us, to work with the poor, but to bring them Jesus, to sit down with them and tell them about Jesus. I know in Santa Ana, uh, you know, the various things that they have in, in working with the poor. If we're not asking them about where they are with Jesus, if they know Jesus, we're not doing what we need to do. Amen? Okay. So, why evangelize? Why evangelize is because that is what we're called to do, and that is the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to be used as a church and as individuals, as a body, to bring people to Jesus. That is the purpose. You know, um, theologians from the Orthodox religion, they have a saying. They say that we're only going to be asked one thing when we get to, in heaven with Jesus. That one thing is going to be, who did you bring with you. Who did you bring with you? Look at your ministry. To what extent are you influencing other people to give their hearts and souls to Jesus Christ? To what extent are you influencing people to start going back to church? To what extent are you welcoming newcomers and having them understand that being part of the community is what they need to do. He commissioned us as I'm commissioning you. He commissioned us to make a difference. He commissioned us to preach to the people about God and, and God and Jesus and about Jesus crucified. They rose again that we may have eternal salvation. One of my favorite scriptures here is Acts 1.8. Now, I want you to picture this. Jesus is ready to ascend into heaven. So he's leaving his disciples. And he basically is giving them marching orders. And if you look at the first chapter of Acts, you look at the 16th chapter of Mark, you look at the 28th chapter of Matthew, and he's saying the same thing. He's saying the number one priority you have is to bring people to me. Somehow we've missed that. Somehow we've missed the fact that our number one priority is to make sure we tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ. We will receive power, which is translated as weakness, the name of our young adult ministry. When, not if, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses. By the way, the witness in Greek means martyr. 
If you're not, look at the A, look at the Beatitudes. What's the key to the Beatitudes? Go ahead, what is it? Wow, give him a good, give him a round of applause. Blessed are they who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of God, for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. If you're not being persecuted, if your family or other people don't say, well, you know, I don't want to hear this Jesus thing, are you really talking about it? I'm not saying, you know, we have to find solutions and not alienate people. But persecution goes along with being a Christian on fire for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And you say to yourself, well, gee, no one's persecuting me at work. They told me at work that I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, pray with people, which I did. I couldn't have Bible studies, which I did. I couldn't, you know, we, we have meetings, we pray together before the meeting just started. I was turned in by three different people. They basically said, this man needs to be fired. I was vice president of sales. He needs to be fired. And the CEO called me in, the VP of Human Resources called me in, and I said, I report to a higher authority. Who are you afraid of offending? Right? Wherever you are, at work, at home, in the parish, always be preaching, preaching and you know, giving the love of Jesus, because that's what it comes down to. You have to be the personification of love. You have to be the personification. When people see you, they see someone who is in love with Jesus Christ. In love with Jesus Christ, burning with fire. Burning with fire. When that happens, we will all be transformed. Our parishes will be transformed. We are told to make disciples of all nations. Don't you love that picture? <laughs> to what extent, and I know you do it, to what extent are we bringing people to Christ when we're doing our homilies? In general, but our homilies when we baptize. If you're like I am, when I have a baptism, uh, the rite of baptism, we're filled with people that have never been to church, that don't know anything about faith. Uh, what a great opportunity to evangelize. What a great opportunity to evangelize you know, during the other sacraments that we're part of. Obviously, our minds. Do we water them down or we tell people now's the time to make a decision for Christ? Uh, go out to the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. This is one of my favorites, too. There is this saying that people quote all the time about St. Francis having said uh, that. Only use words when necessary. That by your actions, people can see. He never said that. It's extremely important you understand that. I go absolutely bonkers when I hear people say it. I hear it all the time. Saint Francis was an evangelist. There's a spoken word called rhema that cuts through bone and marrow. That's right out of scripture. And by the way, in your book. You have all these scriptures of evangelization that we've improved. He never said it because the spoken word is power. The spoken word makes a gigantic difference. How beautiful on the feet of those who bring the good news. When we proclaim the good news, we are blessed. It's impossible to be down, depressed anxious when you're talking about Jesus. Amen? Your whole life is to transform when you're talking about Jesus. When you're sharing Jesus with somebody else, you're always in a good mood. When Marianne is upset with me, I said, tell me about Jesus. <laughs> That's how we stay married for 51 years. Give Marianne a hand. We will be hearing from her in a bit. <laughs> <I'll rebut it. laughs> um, this is one of my favorites. 
I think about this all the time. We have responsibility. If we think we don't have responsibility, we're kidding ourselves. We who know the truth about Jesus Christ, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if we choose not to say anything, we have responsibility. And this scripture is so powerful, I think about it all the time. Paul is saying, no one can put their blood at my doorstep. Let me tell you about a dream I had. I had a dream in which I saw Jesus standing there. I have a lot of dreams, actually, but I saw Jesus standing there, and he had his arms out like this. And he said, thank you. And he beckoned the distance. And I saw all these people come. And there was five, and fifty, and a hundred, and five hundred, and a thousand, and two thousand, countless number of people. They come up, they say, I want to thank you. And I said, I don't know you. They said, well, when you talk to the deacons and wives, one of them was Deacon Angela, and he went and told someone else who told someone else who told me. It's a ripple effect. But then I saw my brothers and sisters. I saw a small group come up. Their heads were down. And they looked up at me, and it just changed my life. They looked up at me, and they said, you knew the truth about Jesus and, and decided not to tell me. I mean, as real as you guys are saying that, that's what I saw. Right before I was called in by Bishop Tim to take on this new assignment, and Bishop Ann, I had a dream, and then that dream was so real. Because, you know, I mean, we're, we're, this is, this is the, the highest level of responsibility that we have. In this dream, I saw a river of souls shrieking going to the hell. And Jesus was standing there with lazy eyes, looked right at me, and said, I called you to make a difference. And a few weeks later, I get a phone call from Bishop Tim asking me to come inside the diocese. But that same dream can be applied to you. You have been called to make a difference. So what is it that is stopping us? Let's take a look at the barriers. Um, we can get that up. The next one is, is going through the barriers. One on her. Okay. What are the barriers that stop us? Yeah, that's a barriers that I just said. Thank you. Okay. First of all, fear of inadequacy. For many of us, we basically think that somebody else is better than me. But you know, the person that comes into your life, whether it be at work, at the parish, at school, wherever it might be, social life, that's the person that God has called for you to share with. Whether you feel like it or not. Paul said it would be convenient or inconvenient. I had a flat tire. How many of you like a flat tire? No, I'm kidding. I had a flat tire. And I'm going, I'm rumbling like the Israelites in the desert. And I'm sitting, you know, on a bench while they're working on the car. And I felt the Lord then come to me and say, I have called you to minister to the uh, garage manager. And I said, Lord, could you have thought of another reason than, you know, a flat tire? You know, another way of doing it. So I went and I, and I talked to him. Because the Lord said, do it. So I talked to him and I said, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm the deacon in the uh, local parish here. Uh, are you Catholic by any way? He goes, yeah. Thank you. Good shape. He says, but I haven't been to church in 30 years. 30 years. And I said, well, I was just sitting over there at that bench, and I was praying, and the Lord said, to come and tell you that he's waiting for you with open arms, that he loves you, and he sent me to tell you that. And he starts crying. And he said, um, I've had these dreams of going back to church. He said, now I know they're true. I'm going to go back to church. Give God a hand. Thank you.
we don't feel like we're adequate, but we are. We often don't feel like doing it, but now is the time. I was at Newport Beach with my bride, and uh, I was really relaxing. And all of a sudden, I see these this young adult woman. They were playing volleyball, and she peels off. And she starts looking up and down, up and down the sand. And, and Mary Ann said, well, don't you want to go help her? But there was another person that went, and another person that went. Five other people went to help her. So it was obvious that five minutes went by, ten minutes, she kept, Mary Ann kept saying, why don't you go help her? Oh, no, they want six people there. You know, on and on and on. And on. Finally, Marianne says, Deacon! You know, that'll do it. And so I got up and started walking, and the Lord said, What she lost, she lost because I wanted to show her how much I love her. You see, Jesus said, You're not worth it. If you think that you're all alone and God doesn't communicate to you, ask Him. Ask Him to come to you. So, so basically, what happened was the Lord said again that he wanted to show her how much he loved her. And so she said to me, um, well, I lost what was so important to me. I lost my wife. My mother gave it to me. It was so important. And she says, you know, it's about 10 yards away. I'm sorry. She said, it's, it's over there. It was actually about 50 yards from where we were. And her friends were over there. She says, I think it's over there. But the Lord said, no. And I know this sounds crazy, but I'm just telling you how. The Lord said, take 10 steps to your right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And because I need help, the Lord said, look down. So I looked down, and because I didn't need more help, it was like the activity scene on the watch. The face of the watch, there was a one grain of sand on it. It was like, they looked for 25 minutes and couldn't find it. Not one grain of sand on it. And it was like this nativity scene beaming off the watch. So I, I walked over to her. And I said, is this what you lost in this place? She said, oh. She starts crying. She said, I can't believe you found it. I said, I just have one question for you. You see, asking questions is the way we evangelize. I said, I ask one question. Do you go to church? She looked at me and she said, I will now. You've got anything. You are not inadequate. You are appointed, anointed. You are confirmed. You are. You have been given holy orders as deacons. As deacon wife, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The devil tries to tell you that you're not an evangelist, that you're not the bright person, that that's false evidence appearing real. Fear of failure. Well, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to embarrass the other person. I'm going to embarrass myself. All of that is again a lie. Second Corinthians 5 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11 6, without faith it's impossible to please God. But if you approach God and believe Him, He will reward you. It is extremely important that you not feel that what you're going to do isn't going to work out. You just simply don't know. But what you do know is that when you step out to faith, that's when the miracles happen. Amen? Don't you like this guy? Fear of appearance is superior. This is a big deal, right? People, it's like people don't want to feel like, oh, they're going to think I'm holier now, and, you know. No, no, the bottom line is this. One of the great lines, and I know that, uh, that Katie Dawson often says this, but it's a very popular line. What is evangelization but one beggar showing another beggar where the food is? We're all sinners. We're all sinners. We're all inadequate. We need each other. We need to be encouraged by one another. All of that is extremely important. But bottom line is this. If you do it in love, if you share the love of God, 
then you never have to worry about feeling superior because they're going to know that you love them. And often, one of the best ways of sharing is talking about your story. You're the fifth gospel. It's your story. No one can argue against that. Amen? Dude, we're not getting involved. Fear of getting involved. So many times we don't want to get involved. We don't want to complicate things. Let someone else do it. What if you knew that you were the only person that could really get through to that person about Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation? What if you really knew that you were the one called by God to make a difference? Get involved. If you have that, the feeling, the tug, to tell somebody about Jesus, do it. I don't understand the teachings of the church. This is a, a very common thing. One of the things we're working on very strongly is to train people about what we believe in. We're working with the schools to train the parents. We're working with confirmation parents. We've got all these programs lined up to teach people about their faith. Because this is a real thing. How many of you have a catechism and look at it regularly? For the rest of you, we have another workshop. Yeah, we need to get a catechism and look up ourselves. Do we know what we believe in? We have a radio uh, network, Spiritual Radio, and we have Norwegian Increase, the one on 11 o'clock. Father Jacob Shea is amazing. The beauty of our Catholic faith. He goes through every aspect of the Mass, every aspect of what we believe in. We have Catholic answers on our radio network, and you can get it by just Spiritual Radio. Put it as an app, internet radio. You put it on your phone iPhone or Android. It's 24-7 program. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can listen to. But we have to be studying all the time. Very important. I don't know how to bring up the subject and what to, what to say. This is often true with family members, right? Just be a person of invitation. Invite them to go to Mass. Invite them to go to a Bible study. I have a mentor on Friday morning. I'm often inviting them in. Mary Ann has Bible studies. We invite people to come. Because the bottom line is that it's extremely important that we're in a position of inviting people and being a people of invitation. How many of you do that on a regular basis? Raise your hand. People go. Sorry, this whole thing is being filmed. So <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I often say that we're in the biggest room, the room for improvement. So it's not what you've done, it's what you want to do going forward. Amen? Going forward, we want to change the face of the earth for Jesus Christ. What's happening right now in the world? When Knights of Columbus by some politicians are called a hate organization, by what is on TV, what is in the airways, what's in the media, we are counterculture. But we have to win back the culture. Amen? I want to go back and say, if not you, then who? If not you, then who? The number one thing for me. In taking this position as director of evangelization and formation was you. Because how much I believe in you. How much I believe in each one of you and how you make a difference. I know many of the things you do. You're out there with the poor. You are preaching. You are doing many good things. But we need to learn how to bless other people. It isn't just about you. To what extent are you building a leadership team? We're going to talk about how we build an evangelization team during the course of our time here. 
To what extent are you identifying talent? If you're in corporate America, I'm senior vice president of sales of a Fortune 25 company. I have 400 leaders under me. The number one responsibility I had, identification of talent. So the number one responsibility. I believe it's one of the number one responsibilities of deacons and deacons' wives. Who's on the cusp of being on fire for Jesus Christ? Who's on the cusp of leadership? To what extent can you identify them? To what extent can you get them involved? Amen? Amen. The last point here is to get out of your comfort zone. How many of you like to share your faith with other people raise your hand? Okay. The people who didn't raise their hand, you're staying over for another session. The people who didn't raise their hand, many of you, are just being honest. It's like, we get nervous. We get uptight. We don't want to offend people. We don't want to say that you all want to hear. Let the Holy Spirit in. Let the Holy Spirit in. Let the Holy Spirit take over your life. Let the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you. You are not alone. To what extent you believe in Jesus Christ? To what extent you believe that through Jesus Christ, He will give you the words to say? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Wherever Paul went, he commissioned people. They give talks all over the country and ultimately all over the world. And wherever I go, I like to commission people to be evangelists. And we're working for it for the I3 program that's going worldwide in the Philippines, Canada, and in 21 cities in the U.S. to commission evangelists, Eucharistic evangelists. I want to pray over each one of you right now to be the evangelist, the Eucharistic evangelist that God has called you to be. Please stand. I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I want you to say it for God in the heaven to hear it. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my ministry to you. I surrender my ministry to you. Take over my life. Take over my life. Completely. Completely. Use me in a mighty way. To bring people to you. Use me to proclaim the truth about how much you love them. About your plan of salvation. Use me to bring light into the darkness. To change the face of the earth with your love. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the intercession of our Blessed Mother, through the intercession of all the young ladies and still saints, through the intercession of St. Joseph, through the protection of St. Michael the Archangel, in Jesus' name, 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 Hallelujah! 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 I commission you through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus to be the evangelist that God has made you to be in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. It is my honor and one of the huge blessings in my life is to work with Katie Dawson. Katie Dawson is director of evangelization and parish evangelization and, and formation. And she's working with all these directors of state formation and working with Emmaus and so many different things to make a difference. 
She's going to get into what the thresholds are now. We're going to start digging into very specific things of how you can take away from this workshop today things to do in terms of tracing yourself on how to evangelize as well as building up this evangelization team within oh, yeah. your parish. Katie Dawson, give her a big round of applause. Okay, well, while I was okay, we'll be here. switching over to thumb drives there, I'll just comment under that, um, the, the, the fears, the things that keep us from evangelizing, I'm thinking of two, two quick stories that um, have occurred to me in the last month that are about my impulse to evangelize and my, my recognition that call my life. So I'm on an airplane flying to Denver Thanksgiving week, Tuesday, um, out of Burbank, which is close to my home, and uh, there's a woman sitting at the, at the window and she's immersed in her Kindle. And, you know, I'm in the middle seat. Great. Love being in the middle seat. Um, and, you know, it crosses my mind, you know, like, huh, oh, I wonder if we might find out what she's reading and get into a conversation. But I was thinking to my book, she sinks into hers, and about halfway through the flight, a little hand comes back from the, from the seat in front of her and kind of pokes at her, and next thing you know, there's a little interaction going on with a three-year-old in the seat ahead of her, and I said, oh, you made a friend. She said, yeah, it's fine. What you reading? She said, oh, it's just trash. What are you reading? Okay, so there's my, there's my opening. Well, I, you know, I really enjoyed, I named a couple of novels, but most of the time what I read for is for work. And let us sit there. Oh, what kind of work do you do? <laughs> well, I help families and um, churches meet the needs of families. You know, we're, we, we have a very broken world these days, a lot of mental health issues, and we really think that we have some good news to share with those families. She says, oh, well, I'm an atheist. I said, okay, well, um, how, how do you explain some like inexplicable things in the world. So we kind of unpacked that question together for a minute or two. It was a fairly light conversation, and um, she told me a couple stories from her professional life as an attorney. Turned out we had a friend in common, and then I felt okay, so this is. Part of the point is, we all have social skills. You know when you've overstayed your welcome. We're gonna we're gonna end this conversation now, right? Okay. I said I said a couple things. I think I planted a couple seeds. She had said a couple of uh, given me a couple of examples from her work with the farm farm workers in the 70s, working with some priests and nuns who were very disillusioned with the church. So I had made some comments about institutional experiences versus personal experiences with God. And um, she was like, oh, okay, I was trying to make a distinction. So we sank back into our books, and about 30 minutes later, I, um, you know, we're getting ready to land, and I said, oh, I was just thinking about a couple of the things that you said, and so I'll just, I'll just put this out there for you. What I believe as a Christian is that we were made by love, for love, and that nothing can separate us from that love if we open ourselves to it. And she was like, mm, okay, that's, that was it. And we left. And I felt like I had responded to God's invitation to plant a seed. It was not an awkward conversation, a very graceful conversation. All the way along, I paid attention to the social cues and I asked her some questions. So um, so that, that was the one where I really completed it. The other one, this past week, I noticed that there's a young girl who gets on the train. I, I ride the train every day from Los Angeles, many of you know that. And I get on the train in Northridge, and this young girl has been getting on the same car and sitting in the same area as me. She's clearly going to school across town. And so this particular day, she and I were the only ones in the space, the way the, the, way the train cars are laid out, and I, I 
came and sat down at my Did table and said, oh, fancy meeting you here. Yeah. And, yeah. and she yeah. chuckled, and that was the end. And I said, where, where are you headed? And she said, oh, I go to school in East L.A. at some art school. And I asked her what she's studying, and um, she's studying singing, and I'm a singer. And I said, well, what are you singing? And she said, I'm a mezzo. I said, oh, me too. Stay tuned. We will be having future conversations on the train where I find out where does she belong, what does she ex experience as her sense of purpose and meaning in her life, and who does she think she wants to be when she grows up. So those are three important areas to explore with people when we're trying to evangelize them, when we're trying to open that conversation up, touch on that. Okay, so I have the clicker. That's good. So we're going to talk about walking with others on the path to a relationship with Jesus. And um, many of you will have seen the book published around 2012 by Sherry Vidal called Forming Intentional Disciples. Anybody here read this book? Well, not everybody, good, so I won't be boring all of you with the information out of that book. Um, Cardinal Dolan called this book the most important Catholic book of the decade because what Sherry Waddell did is she gave us a framework and um, named an experience that many of us were having. When I read this book, my experience was, well, yes, that's exactly what I've seen happen. And she put language to it and, and this framework, this process. So, um, increasingly, two concepts emerge in forming intentional disciples that have become common parlance today. So, you remember Pope Francis published Evangeliality on the Joy of the Gospel, in which he calls forth missionary disciples, not exactly the same language as intentional disciples. And he has um, repeatedly, in the 10 plus years of his papacy, called us to accompany others on a journey to Jesus and to walk with others. Now, I don't think that, I don't think Pope Francis read Forming Intentional Disciples. I think the Holy Spirit is moving among us, moving in the church with us, as the Holy Spirit always does in times of crisis in the church. You can, you can trace the activity of the Holy Spirit in response to every crisis in the church. Just when you think it's all going down the drain, some movement, some new order, some new experience emerges. And I think that we, when we look around the landscape of the church today, we can see tremendous fruitfulness. And the interesting thing about cultural change and a church change is that it seems to happen all at once. But in fact, the signs of change are bubbling beneath the surface for many, many years before a change emerges. So I want to I want to unpack some of what Sherry Waddell talks about in saying that we are called to form intentional disciples in response to the Great Commission to Matthew 28 that says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, which, you know, is also the the particular scripture heading up our strategic plan. So as Deacon Steve already mentioned, the church exists to evangelize. This is our fundamental message. I think you've probably heard that a million times by now, right? The church exists to evangelize. Now, when we say evangelize, sometimes people respond by thinking of a, a Jehovah's Witness at their door or a preacher on the corner. But that is really quite different than the dynamic that we're going to talk about today, which is about accompanying someone, which can be a lot longer term thing than knocking on somebody's door. Not that street evangelization or door knocking is not a very fruitful and helpful thing to do, and it has a lot of impact on the people who do it, as well as those whom they contact. Contact. But what we want to talk about today is when you initiate an evangelizing conversation, what should you be aware of? So Sherry calls this thresholds of conversion. 
And she gives us this linear example moving from trust to curiosity, openness, seeking, and discipleship. So these are the five basic thresholds that someone who is moving from unbelieving to believing will travel one way or the other. Some of these stages will be short, some of them will be long. And um, the reality is that it's not actually usually a linear experience. Usually someone travels a very circuitous route from trust to curiosity and then maybe back to building trust again. Then they, they get a little more curiosity and maybe they move to openness, but whoops, somebody you know kicked them in the shins and they run back to trust. Somebody said something that offended them and their trust is broken. So then they start over again, but maybe with a little residual trust still in the mix. So usually people do not travel in a straight line from unbelief to believing and following Jesus. They, they do this, this roundabout way. And what Sherry has done here with this chart is she's, she has overlaid it with baptism. So just because somebody is baptized, we know it does not mean that they have actually met and are following Jesus, right? So baptism is, is underlaying all of this. There is grace available to people who have been baptized. They have been given the grace of the sacrament, but they have to open themselves to it, and it is in the process of traveling these um, thresholds that the grace becomes active. A good illustration of the dynamic of the thresholds is seen in the a story of the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. And we can recognize that the Samaritan mo woman moves from challenge to question to urgent inquiry to satisfaction and then to proclamation all in a matter of, what, 45 minutes? Two hours? She travels a great distance in a very short period of time. We won't often see someone move with that kind of speed. And again, you know, Jesus was in front of her, so I figured we have a little extra, a little extra oomph in that conversation, right? But it is a great illustration of the dynamic that we're talking about. Deacon Steve commented that questions are key. And when we are working with others who are considering a relationship with Jesus, the first place we start is by asking them a question. Now, you as deacons and deacons' wives occupy a role of authority in the institution, so many, many times you are going to encounter people who give you a little extra acknowledgement because you represent God. Okay, so you are not starting from ground zero when someone comes to you for baptism or, or hears you preach at a, at a mass or meets you on the campus at church. You occupy a slightly different role, and which both has its benefits and its limitations because, of course, you're going to toe the church line, some people will think, right? But on the other hand, it gives you a little warrant to be maybe a little more intrusive than the lady on the train speaking to the high school student, right? So when Deacon says he's at the, he's at the mechanic and he, he, be, he leads with, I'm a deacon at the church, which then it's like, well, of course, then it's your business. It's your business to say, do you go to church? Are you Catholic? So you have, a, you have a little different entree. You also have an opportunity, both as deacons and deacon wives, to be provocative about how you spend your time. So I did learn some years back not to simply say when someone asks, you, asks me, what do I do for a living? I don't say, I work for a church. No. I give them a story. I tell them, oh, well, you know what? I, I serve a number of churches in developing responses to the needs of families. You know, families have a lot of needs, a lot of, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of disruption, and, and, and we, we think that we can help them. 
We need to deliver some healing messages, some, both words and prayers. And you know, depending on the on whether or not their eyes start to glaze over, I can make quite a speech about what we do in my office. And I and I am trying to provoke their curiosity. So, okay. One thing I want to mention about people moving through these thresholds, when someone starts to consider that maybe a relationship with God is possible and it could mean a lot of change in their life, it can be quite a, a daunting experience, right? You start, you start to be on the, on the brink of an epiphany that means that everything is different than you thought it was. And it might mean reorienting some of your decisions. It might mean giving up some of your, your behaviors. It might mean you're going to have to reorganize your career, your work life. I live in Chatsworth, which for quite a while was known as the pornography capital of Los Angeles, right? A lot of people there whose lives are upended when they do, in fact, meet Jesus. They have some very obvious, significant changes to make. But somebody involved in the porn industry is not the only one that has to reorient their decision-making when they meet Jesus. So. We need to keep in mind when we're walking with someone who's considering following Jesus that we are in the deep end of the pool and we know the water is fine, but we, they are sticking their toes in the shallow end and it feels pretty cold to them. And we need to resist the, the impatience that can come when we are trying to help somebody meet Jesus where we want to say, just jump in, the water's fine. No, instead we want to acknowledge, we want to affirm, and we want to reassure them that in fact, everything is better with Jesus. Pope Francis says this, that we need to deliver the message that life with Jesus is not the same as life without Jesus, and it is so much better. Holly Ordway is a, is a former atheist academic, now works for Word on Fire Institute. She has a book called Not God's Type, in which she documents her experience of reevaluating her academic atheism, which was quite intellectual and well-developed. She says that at a moment of transition from unbelieving to the recognition of the truth, having examined all the argumentation on a rational level and resolved... It was completely new, utterly unexpected, and uninvited. What had happened was that I recognized a change in my internal state, and it was something like a fever. I felt everything was crystal clear and, and way too sharp. The very rocks and trees and sky seemed full of meaning. I felt the presence of someone. I was overwhelmed someone that was with me, yet outside me, and with the feeling something like dread and quite a bit like fear, I recognized that God was with me. So that I think that's, a, you know, we need to understand that, that we have this experience that living a life following Jesus is a beautiful and wonderful thing. But for those that are considering that maybe he is true and it changes everything, it can be quite frightening. So we, we, want, we want to be very supportive of people as they're developing trust with us. My friend Michael Gormley is a youth minister in Texas, and he, um, he works also in prison ministry, and he tells an amazing story of being, being um, at the prison, giving a retreat, and one of the prisoners identified themselves as Wiccan. And uh, how do you evangelize someone like that? Oh, I'm Wiccan. When they said that they were Wiccan, Michael very intentionally steered the, the conversation completely away from religion and initiated an argument instead about which video game was better, Super NES or Sega Genesis. And they proceeded to build a conversation, a relationship around this debate. And finally, the guy was talking about the last video game he played before he went to prison, and he said, 
You know, I never realized you fancy preacher guys liked video games. I came to this Catholic retreat because I done got saved when I was 15 at a tent revival, and I know all about the Protestant stuff, but I really don't know about the Catholic stuff. And besides, this is something different, and you've got better food. <laughs> Thanks. Michael says that he could tell he was at least open to Christ's movement in his life, and he came to every Catholic session held in the chapel following the retreat, and the conversation with Michael continued. Wiccan stuff, Catholic stuff, video games. Michael points to this as an example of pre-evangelization and building that bridge of trust says that it was necessary preparation to the gospel that starts with just listening to others and sharing common interests. My husband is pretty preoccupied with evangelization, but he does have one vice. He is an addict to Gonzaga basketball. He will be on the board late at night interacting with different the 250 or, I don't know, 1,000 guys who all follow Gonzaga basketball. They're not doing so great this year, by the way. Um, but we, we have three kids that went to Gonzaga, and then when they started their rise to prominence in the basketball world, it was very, very happy at our house. And so one place where Tim has been able to evangelize is around conversations about basketball. Because, you know, guys don't always really want to talk about Jesus right away. But they'll talk sports, right? Or boats or cars or, you know, fixing something. And that's good. Like, I used to think that if I didn't get straight to the point with Jesus that I'd chickened out. But actually, it was a, it was a really good idea to build that trust before. So back to our prisoner, it actually did result in a fruitful outcome for him. Some weeks later, as Michael made his way to a chapel to give a talk, the prisoner hollered, Yo, Gormer, that was, that was his nickname, you know how I said I was Wiccan and stuff? Well, I officially changed my prison status to Roman Catholic. Thank you for all your help. And the prisoner entered RCIA and is on his way to become Catholic all because of an argument about Super NES and Sega Genesis. So the first stage somebody comes into in the spiritual journey, oh, a little ahead of myself there, is building this bridge of trust. They show up at church, they might be there because they have a little bit of trust in the church itself, or maybe because they trust grandma who said they should get their baby baptized, or maybe they have a fond association with Christmas or Easter, um, it doesn't mean that they have deep, profound trust in us or in the institution, but there's something, something there. And our job at this point is to strengthen that trust, to affirm them, broaden whatever is in place, and we do this by being normal. We do this by being warm and welcoming, invitational. We focus on their desire for connection, for community and belonging. A great example of uh, an institutional process to foster trust is what San Francisco Solano has done with their Belong, Believe, Become signs all over campus. You show up at San Francisco Solano, it says, you belong here. And if you go on their website, it says, let's make it official. We want you to register. At any rate, they really emphasize this process. We used to say 30, 40, 50 years ago, in order to become Catholic, you had to believe, and you had to behave, and then you could belong. But all the data suggests, all the best practices are pointing to, we need to focus on you are welcome, you belong, here's what we do here, here's what we believe, and then the moral life follows. So all those years ago when I hesitated to tell an unmarried single mother that she needed to do something about her marital status, I, you know, some, she brought her baby, or she brought her child for First Communion, living with her boyfriend, and I, I flinched interiorly. I was like, if I tell her the truth, she's going to go away. 
The truth is she's living in sin and the church wants to fix that. But I've got to build a relationship with her before I can tell her that news. So I did that, but at the time I remember feeling like I had chickened out. And then when I read Sherry Waddell, I was like, no, I was building a bridge of trust. Now sooner or later we have to deliver the truth. I'm not suggesting that we just let people, you know, God loves us too much to leave us where we are, right? He wants us to live in conformity with him, to be incorporated into him, and that's true of her as well. So we need to take a look at how we get someone moving in that direction, but we don't deliver it right right at the beginning. So trust is the first step, and listening Listening is a key component. So a lot of times we think about evangelization as delivering information, telling people something. But in fact, it's a lot more important to ask them a good question. And it could be simply, I have, I have 22 nieces and nephews. I'm the oldest of five. We all, my mother is a convert. We all went to church every Sunday. My brothers and sisters all took their kids to church. And maybe 10 go to church. Anybody else? Right? Um, and so when we get together for a family gathering, I'm asking myself, what's the question? What question am I going to ask beyond how's work? You know? So my most recent one has been, so what got you through the pandemic? What, you know, what sustained you? And I'm hoping maybe maybe we can like pull that thread and get to a place where I can say, well, you know, I, I, I couldn't have done it without a little bit of help from Jesus, you know, and maybe point them in that direction. You know, that's the thing about an evangelizing conversation is it's always an adventure because you don't know what the other person is going to say, right? But giving some thought to what question you're going to ask is really, really important. So after trust, we move to curiosity. And with curiosity, a person is intrigued and wondering, is it possible that God is real? Is it possible that Jesus really wants to be in my life? Is he, did he really rise from the dead? Is he really present now? So they have these questions. Now, we build trust by being normal, but we foster curiosity by being weird. We spend our money differently than the rest of the world, right? We prioritize things that the average person do not prioritize. And we spend an awful lot of time at church. I've had friends say to me, you know another meeting? What? Now, now I am a professional Catholic, but back in the day when I was raising my children and I was home, I still spend a lot of time at church. And my neighbors would be like, where, where are you going? Oh, church again. Okay. So, you know, that can provoke some curiosity when we spend our time, our energy, our money in different ways. And we look for ways to kind of open the door of conversation. Let them, out. you know, don't shut down that conversation if it comes up. If somebody says, I, I noticed that you, you donated your car to the church. What? Why don't you do that? You know, where, where are your priorities? Like, well, my priorities are that there's a homeless couple in our parish and they really need a vehicle so he can get a job. So, you know, we, we want to tell stories not so that they redound to us. We don't, you know, that's a very, very uh, dangerous place is to make it sound like we're real super saints, you know. Oh, yes, you know, I'm, I'm moving to Calcutta to join Mother Teresa soon. Um, so, you know, we, we, have to, we have to keep our, our humility out in front, but at the same time provoke that curiosity. So I think a good story about curiosity comes from a book. Um, I think Dynamic Catholic has distributed this one. Richard Cole wrote Catholic by Choice. And he, he was a Protestant married to a Catholic, and he was going to church with his wife, but not really, not really all in, right? 
One evening after mass, I was wandering around and I discovered something called a chapel of perpetual adoration. When I first walked in, the place seemed dark and creepy and all my Protestant feelers were going off. The air was stale and sweet with an odd smell. It was either incense or cheap disinfectant. Three or four people were sitting praying, some just sitting. In the front, there was a silver cross with a disc in the middle, which I later learned was the Eucharistic host. A young woman wearing a scarf looked up to me, looked up at me, returned to her reading. An old air conditioner was working hard in the background, kicking on for a few minutes and then kicking off. I looked around to discover a log in beside the door, and then I understood what was going on. We know what was going on. 24-hour adoration. People were signing in. He figured that out. Sure enough, there were names for every slot. Venancio, 2 to 3 a.m. Lucille, 6 a.m. Maria, 7 a.m. I was astonished and fascinated. Here was a window into Catholic life that I had had no idea. I said to myself, Toto, we are not in Kansas anymore. I stayed a few minutes longer, but couldn't breathe, needed fresh air, and at home I told Lauren about it, and she said, oh yeah, perpetual adoration. You'll be there someday taking a shift. That night I kept thinking about it. All night long, they were there, keeping watch like a power utility, constantly praying, never shut down. The next time I visited San Jose, I went straight to the chapel. Outside I had read... Um, Outside, he had read a little bit about adoration, neighborhoods with lower crime rates where adoration is happening. I opened the door. The minute I stepped in, I was almost overwhelmed with the impulse to throw myself down on the carpet in front of the host. Mind you, he's not Catholic yet. Suddenly, the whole idea of devotion to the Eucharist made all the sense in the world. This chapel was holy, it was holy, but then on the wall, I noticed a small handwritten notice, do not lie on the floor. <laughs> so one of the best ways to provoke curiosity is to ask someone a question, something probing, something deep, um, not just about work. I remember when I was running adult confirmation in the parish, I, I had to run a few people through really quick. That ever happen at your parish? Father calls me and... March, I'm not working for the parish anymore, I'm already down here, and he says, I have an emergency, they're getting married in June, I need to get them confirmed. And I'm like, ugh. Okay, so I ran confirmation sessions twice a week for like four or five weeks. And I used the opening session of Alpha, Is There More to Life Than This? And we discussed whether or not, what, what is your life purpose? And this 28-year-old sitting in front of me had this arrested look on his face. I never thought about that, he said. Does my life have a purpose? I was like, yeah, we're going to have to talk about this. Okay, so that is, that is a, a good question to ask somebody. You know, what, what, is your, what, is your ultimate gain, what is your ultimate goal in life? Somewhere I lost, oh, there it is. Just checking my time here. Okay, sorry. Um, so we want to help people to face up to the big questions in life, like where do I belong? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? Those, those are the three key questions that every human will be, will be running in the background of every human's life. Where do I belong? What is my purpose in life? And where do I find meaning? And we have great answers for those questions, right? So we want to help them to take a look at that. We can suggest a movie or lend a book that could lead to deeper questioning. I do this all the time because otherwise I make speeches. So rather than make speeches to people, I say, you know, I've got this great book. You might find it interesting. Or here's a, here's a really good podcast. You might, you might find it helpful. So I'm always pushing resources out in our little family group chat, um, both the, the extended, my, my own family of origin, and then my own kids. My kids have not figured out what I'm doing to them yet. But 
but they actually go to church on Sunday, so I'm just trying to make sure that they keep going to church on Sunday and that no one picks them off, right? Um, okay, so from curiosity, people can ask a lot of questions, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are open to change, right? Because, and this is a very, this is that frightening stage. It's all well and good to ask questions. Was Jesus real? Did he really live? What's the historical record say? Is there evidence? Um, you know, argue about, argue about the new atheists. There's a lot of interesting conversations that can be had. But when you start to think about whether or not those things are true and what the implications are, then you're talking change, talking reorienting. And this is the kind of change that the apostles experienced when they dropped their nets, right? It's like, talk about a revolution. They're there sustaining their business, doing the, the fishing thing. Jesus comes along and says, follow me. And they say, sure. And they drop their nets and walk away. And they follow him. That's a lot of change. And people experience the invitation to follow Jesus as a lot of change. Because if they really understand what's being asked of them, it means they're going to reprioritize their money, their time, and their energy. If you think about it, the rich young ruler in Mark 10, he faced change, right? He says to Jesus, I have done everything that the law commands since my youth. And Jesus says, that's great. He says, what more do I need to do? Reorient your entire life, give up everything you have, and follow me, right? So this is, this is um, a very scary thing for somebody who's looking at following Jesus for the first time. Serious, enduring intercession is crucial. This is why we need to be prayed up. This is why we need intercessors in our parishes. This is why we ourselves need to do spiritual battle for the people that we are working with and call down the Holy Spirit. We do this work in the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot white knuckle evangelization. Because the only person that changes someone's heart is God. We do not change hearts. What we do is we set the conditions. We ask the questions. We provoke the curiosity. But it is the Holy Spirit that moves hearts. So we have to be inviting the Holy Spirit into the process. If we think that we can make it happen on our own, we got another thing coming. Just not going to happen. And sometimes when we look at our efforts and we say they're not fruitful, we need to ask, did I pray? Now, when I say pray, uh, one of the things I find very interesting about the fruits of prayer is when I say to God, help, he always helps me. I don't have to do a mimina, although they're good. I don't have to, like, exert a whole lot of effort, but I need to direct my attention to God and invite the Holy Spirit in, and voila, things happen. It's rather shocking. God is very generous. When we ask for him to help us, he helps us, and we don't have to work for it. I mean, that's, that's the grace. So, okay, openness is not discipleship. It is tentative. It is an openness to the possibility and what we are trying to do when we are working with somebody who we, we are moving them from curiosity to openness, the Holy Spirit is moving them, we are hoping to get them to a place where they are actively seeking Jesus, where they are asking serious questions that are dating with a purpose. They are not just dating with Jesus. They are considering committing themselves. And in order to do this, they have to lower defenses. They have to let go of cynicism and antagonism and acknowledge that God might be real. And one, one really great way to help someone move in this space is to say, look, why don't you just try it out? Say to God, and this is very sneaky, I got to tell you, this always works. Say to God, if you're real, please show me. 
and he always shows up. That is the prayer I prayed when I was 16 and having a, you know, like a, a 18 month, I don't believe in God thing. And my mom said, just keep asking God to show up and he will. My convert mother, she knew. So I did and he did. And I've never encouraged someone to pray that prayer that I haven't seen them move forward to commit to Christ. So Pope Benedict XVI's opening homily when he was ordained, when he was raised to Pope said, if we let Christ enter fully into our lives, if we open ourselves totally to him, are we not afraid that he might take something away from us? Are we not perhaps afraid to give up something significant, something unique, something that makes life so beautiful? Do we not then risk ending up diminished and deprived of our freedom? And he said, no. God gives us all of it and more. And he does not deprive us of anything. We do not have to be afraid. And we need to say that to the people that we're working with. Hey, we're doing okay. So I want to tell you a story about Nathan. Because Nathan was raised, raised Christian. And he was a friend in an artist. He had friends in this artist community. And there was a Christian there. But Nathan was no longer considering himself a believer. And he was an art major. And he drew and he sketched almost constantly. And these two guys, Don and Nathan, started to share their work with each other. Now, Don was writing, and, and Nathan was drawing and painting, but Don was writing mainly about Jesus at that time, so Nathan became very interested in Don's experience of Jesus. But Nathan had really considered Jesus a relic from his childhood. He had discarded faith as something that was from his childhood. But through their conversations, Nathan started exploring Jesus seriously, and Don thought that he was a seeker. So Don invited Nathan to join a group of guys going down to Mexico to build a house. And while they were building the house, there was a message every night. This is an evangelical context. There was a message every night to the group. And it became apparent to Don that Nathan was not actually yet seeking that he was just curious. And so Don was rather frustrated by that because he thought, he thought Nathan was a little further down the road than that. But okay, we're going we're to work with him in curiosity. And he had to exercise a lot of patience with Nathan. Ultimately, um, Nathan said yes when he was asked to commit to Christ at, a, at a, you know, an altar call. But what he was really committing to was more like, Jesus is cool. I, I think Jesus does cool things. He was not committing to reorient his life. So Nathan, so Don had to exercise more patience and walk with Nathan further. And the point of the story is not Nathan, it's Don. So Don was in a hurry for Nathan to make a commitment. And he really had to pray for Nathan and he had to walk with him for an extended period of time before he ultimately did make a commitment to Jesus. And that patience, we have to cultivate that patience. A lot of people, when they're in this stage, they will give God a trial run. That's a good, good point, a good point at which to offer them that prayer. God, if you're really real, show me. And they need to know that we are their friend, that we are there for them, no matter what they decide. We can suggest small experimental steps because small steps are easier. So we invite someone to, well, why don't you just spend a few minutes on prayer every day? Why don't you just read the gospel of the day and ask God to show you what he's doing? When we're talking about introducing people to Jesus, we are not introducing them to the church. We are introducing them to a life of faith. The church sustains that faith, but we have to be careful that we are not evangelizing them to our church. We are evangelizing them to Jesus, and they are living that life out with Jesus in the context of the church. So we have to invite them to pray, to read scripture, to participate in 
in prayer meetings and Bible studies and to go to mass and to, and to live the sacramental life. But all the while, what we're pointing to is a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes people seem to be seeking, but they're not. Their questions are hiding deeper issues. But we can point them to the healing and the, and the thriving and the flourishing that God wants for them. And we can reassure them that whatever their history, what, wherever they come from, no matter what their baggage, forgiveness and mercy are here. How many stories have we heard of someone who was afraid to put their foot on a church ground because they were sure that the people would reject them or that God would actually send a lightning bolt if they showed up at church? But we know that's not true. We need to tell them the truth about what God offers them. Okay, and what we're after, this is our goal, intentional discipleship. No one follows Jesus by accident. There are a lot of good people in the world who do wonderful, generous things and say that they do not believe in God or that they do not follow Jesus. That doesn't take anything away from the fact that they are good and generous, big-hearted people. That's not what we're trying to make happen. We are introducing people to Jesus because he will sustain them in that virtue and in that life of, of goodness, and he will grow it to supernatural proportions. So what we are after is intentional discipleship, somebody saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus in the heart of his church. So that pretty much takes us to the, to the intentional discipleship thing. I want, I want to comment here on what this is for, because a lot of this is stuff that I imagine it either is something you know or that resonates, that you, you've experienced it or you already knew it in your head and your heart. But how many people in your parish know how to have this accompaniment relationship with someone? How many people in your parish know how to evangelize? So really what, what I'm presenting to you here is available to you as we go forward in talking about building evangelization teams in your parish because evangelization is not a program and it's not just about doing things differently, making our, our masses more welcoming or putting up beautiful signs saying, you belong here, okay? Evangelization really, especially in the postmodern time that we live in, is best done customized, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you think about the, your child or your family member or your cousin, who doesn't go to church, who doesn't believe anymore, and what kind of conversation you could have with them or, or someone in your parish who has a cousin or a family member or a friend, what kind of conversation they could have. You have to understand these dynamics in order to be effective in those conversations. have to recognize this person isn't there yet. So when we say, why don't you show up at church on Sunday? We're expecting the, the behavior of a disciple from somebody who's only curious. So why do we have Catholics who show up at church once a month or once every couple of months? Because they don't believe. They don't believe the Eucharist is the real presence of Jesus. They don't believe that God is supposed to be at the center of their life, or they would show up. Hold on. <coughs> it's not COVID. <coughs> so I'm curious, who in your life do you have in mind when you think about evangelization? like to ask you to turn to your neighbor and talk about someone that needs the good news. 